Hello and welcome to today's panel discussion, which is part of the Rethinking Inequalities series. I'm James McIntosh. I'm a columnist at The Wall Street Journal. And of course, top of mind for everyone today is the pandemic. Now, the effects of the coronavirus on inequality have been quite mixed. Most obvious is the impact on health, where existing inequalities have been worsened. Diseases of the poor turn out to make COVID-19 even more dangerous. And of course, there's the age impact as well. It hits the old harder than it hits the young. The effect on income inequality is a bit less obvious, in, mostly because in the short run, governments have done a lot more to cushion income in the past year than they normally do in a recession. In fact, in the US, they've gone so far that under the CARES Act, actually two thirds of the newly unemployed got more than they would have done had they been working. Although, of course, that has now expired. But levels of government support vary pretty widely, and at least in not just in the US, but in some other countries as well, have been coming down. So now we've got an interesting question about what's going to happen in uh, the wake of the pandemic to income inequality. And some of that will depend on the nature of work, of course. Those of us lucky enough to be able to work from home have been, in the main, largely unaffected. Again, that's tended to hit the low paid harder because most of their jobs don't work from home. In particular, the service sector is particularly uh, predominant, um, uh, predominantly low paid and has in many countries been all but shut down. It is true that some low paid jobs though, like call centres, have switched to remote working, um, while other people who were in well paid jobs have had their industry completely decimated. So it's not a, it's not a pure rich versus poor issue. Um, and then finally, I should say the inequality has also shown up in the stock market. So the pandemic winners, Zoom, Amazon, companies like that performed fabulously well, while there have been some horrific losers, industries like airlines, where revenues and stock prices have absolutely collapsed. Now, to discuss all of this, um, and the possible future as we emerge from the pandemic and what government should do about it. We've got a great panel. Um, Branko Milan Milanovic from City University of New York, uh, most famous for his uh, elephant chart, shows how global inequality has shifted. Uh, Janet Curry from Princeton, who focuses on health and well-being and has done a lot of work, particularly on uh, health and uh, inequalities among children. Um, and David Dawn from Zurich, who, who uh, was uh, one of those who exposed the role of superstar firms in dragging down the labour share of the economy. Now, just before we get going, I do want to highlight this is an interactive panel. We're looking forward to your questions. If you just open up a new browser tab at menti.com and plug in the code that's up on the screen now, which is 8396043, I'd suggest opening up that tab and putting in the code now so you're ready to ask the question when it pops into your mind as you're listening to the panellists. So to start, let's go over to Branko and uh, we'll have a, a quick presentation um, from Branko followed by the others. Well, thank you very much, James. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. I would be obviously brief as you told me to be. And uh, I have a little bit of a historical background to, to, to give to this talk. Uh, I would start with a slide which actually, as you can see, shows actually the title is there. It's like a long durée. It's like uh, basically looking over two centuries of income inequality starting from 1820s. And I called it from Karl Marx to Franz Fanon and back to Marx. The reason, as you can see in the following slide, is that inequality has actually increased tremendously, I mean, I'm talking about global inequality, meaning inequality between citizens of the world, has increased tremendously throughout the 19th century. Now, why did it actually go up? It's kind of easy to understand if you think of the three parts of the world, basically, this uh, sort of uh, influencing what happens to global inequality. And this is the Western Europe and North America on the one hand, and then China and then India on the other or third hand, if you will. Uh, and what happened during the 19th century is that you had, of course, the rise of the West, 
Western countries became much richer. India and China either stagnated or actually in the case of China even went down. So the gaps between countries became enormous and, and you can see that in a blue bar which actually shows you the part of the Gini coefficient which is due to the between country inequality that actually quite, uh, went quite significantly up. Actually, it is between tail. I mean, it's a different type to look at the inequality. I didn't use Gini in this particular case, but the story is the same. And then the orange part is actually within national inequalities. So what you had throughout the 19th century and all the way probably to the First World War, you had an increase in between country inequalities and a rise of inequality within nation states. You know, think of the fact that actually inequality between, you know, capitalists and workers went up and so forth. Then you have really the short, the 20th century, as it is called, where you have inequality at the peak. Uh, there you notice that actually the blue bar really is extremely high and it remains at that very, very high level. That's why I called it Franz Fanon, because that was the time where actually the three worlds were really very rigid. And that's where sort of our concept of the three worlds and the third world actually comes from. It is the time where you had very high inequality between nations and you also had a stagnation or even a decline of inequality within nation states. I mean, this is something that was quite well known, you know, the Western countries became less unequal, socialist countries became less unequal, even countries like Turkey where they had import substitution strategies became less unequal. Now we are in the third period, and that started probably at the end of the previous century, where we have a significant decline uh, in between country inequality. That's why the blue bar is now shrinking. And what is driving that decline is the rise of Asia. In other words, I think actually it's very useful to see the current rise of Asia as a mirror image to what happened in the first industrial revolution. The first one, of course, launched the Western countries to an upward path, and they basically increase global inequality. This one is doing the opposite, is actually making Asia sort of take over, take the place that it had before the Industrial Revolution and thereby reducing inequality. So that's where we are now. So we are in a period of reduced global inequality, which is still very high, but it's getting less and it's being reduced thanks to Asia. So it would be like a summary. Now let's move to the next slide, which actually gives you what happened in a much more recent period between 2008 and 2013 slash 14. These are the latest data that I have because you basically have to have data from almost 150 countries to actually calculate things like this. Now what is shown on this graph is on the horizontal axis percentile in income distribution. This is your position, whether you are very poor, which would be very low number, like the first, second percentile, or you're very rich, in which case the number would be 100. So that would be the famous top 1% on the horizontal axis. On the vertical axis, it shows what was the gain in real income terms, and it's adjusted for differences in price levels between the countries and um, uh, over the period between 2008 and 2013. For some of you who might remember the so-called elephant graph, the chart looks somewhat similar to this one, but there was one big exception, and I'll come to that in a minute. So if you look at this chart, you notice first, as it was titled here, continued very strong growth around the global median. Now, people who are around that position are basically people from the Asian countries. Again, as I mentioned, China, but it's not only China, it's also Vietnam, India, Indonesia, and so forth. Essentially, for them, the growth continued. And actually, in some cases, the growth accelerated after the financial crisis. Then the next point is where you see people who are around the 80th percentile, which, is, which means that these people are richer than the previous group, but they had no growth. And that's, again, the position of Western middle classes. That's the same position that they were in if you look from the period 1988 to 2008. So these two points really remained practically unchanged uh, after the financial crisis. Now, what has changed is that the third point, which in the previous graph used to be really high and give like a sort of a, a elephant-like uh, or trunk-like shape to the top, now that point is now quite low. In other words, there was a slowdown of growth of the global top 1%. 
And uh, this is very obvious, actually, if you look, you look at the U.S. data, you actually see that between 2010 and 2013, uh, the top 1% and the top 5% actually barely recovered the position that they were in uh, real terms, they were, they were before the crisis. Now, it could be, my last point, it could be that that position has changed and improved over the next five-year period up to the global financial crisis. So that's, I think, where we are now. We are now still in a sort of an elephant-looking chart, essentially driven by the success of Asia. And with China not slowing down this year nearly to the same extent as the rest of the world, I think that particular pattern will continue. But the big questions are, of course, what happens to India, which is actually now the crucial player in global inequality, and also what happens to Africa. But I would say that the convergence of incomes in the sense that of, of reduced global inequality is very likely to actually be even uh, uh, accelerated during the crisis. Thank you, Branko. Great to have a have a big picture uh, overview to start us off. Uh, Janet, I think you're now going to zoom us right in um, and focus on just two countries. Yes, so I want to talk about health inequalities and the question of what is the relationship between economic inequality and health inequality? You know, that is, how does this economic inequality get under the skin? And is it the same for all groups? So if we move to the next slide, I have a particular way of trying to do that, which is that I'm going to take all the areas in a country from richest to poorest and rank them uh, put them into groups that each represent about the same amount of the population, and then just plot those points. Okay, so it's a pretty simple method, and it lends itself to comparison across time and across places. Um, show you the next slide. Uh, this is just a schematic to try and sort of indicate how all of these pictures I'm going to show you look. So on the bottom axis, we have things ranked from the least poor to the most poor, and then we have a death rate. Okay, and most of the time, lines slope up, which shows that poor people have higher death rates than rich people. We're going to be looking at changes in these lines over time. So if a line shifts down in a parallel way, like between those two red lines, what that means is that mortality has fallen, but in the same way for rich and poor people. Whereas if the line gets flatter, that shows that there's less inequality. And if you have a totally flat line, that shows that there's no inequality in mortality, even if there's inequality in income. So if we look at the next slide, we can see how this has been evolving over time in the United States for different age groups. And so for most of these lines, I've kind of suppressed those uh, means. I just left them in for 2018, which is the most recent line here indicated in red. So you can see if you look, for example, at little children, zero to four, that in the United States, there's been huge declines in mortality rates. And those have happened more in the poorest places than in the richest places. So mortality has fallen and inequality and in mortality has also fallen. Okay. This is not the case for people in prime age groups. So if you look at 20 to 49 year olds, for example, shockingly mortality even increased um, at, between 2010 and 2018. So in that very short period of time, that mostly reflects the impact of the opioid epidemic. And then looking at 65 plus, you see that mortality continued to decline. And uh, for the oldest old, 80 and over, it became almost equal. Okay, so we have economic inequality increasing for everybody, but very different things going on for different age groups in terms of health inequalities, which really reflects the fact that the youngest and the oldest are protected by public health insurance and other institutions and other groups were not. Uh, if you go to the next slide, I showed the same picture for males. 
it looks pretty much the same. And what I want to look at next, moving to the next slide, is a comparison between the US and in this case, France. Okay, so here the blue lines are for the US, the red lines are for France, the uh, heaviest lines are for 2010 and the more dashed, the dashed dot line, I don't know if you can see it very well, is for 2018. So the thing that strikes you the most from this, I think, is how much flatter the lines are for France than they are for the US. So inequality and mortality is much less. Mortality rates are also much less today in France than they are in the US, even in the richest places, which is, uh, oh, you know, interesting, but I don't have time to go into it. And you can see that mortality continued to decline between 2010 and 2018 in France, whereas in uh, the US, as I indicated, it was actually increasing for a lot of groups. And again, you can see the same um, thing if you go to the next slide, if you look at males. Okay. Um, so, you know, what are the, the takeaways from this? So we know that inequality in income has grown a lot in the US over time. Um, after declining for a century, mortality rates actually grew for prime aged people, but the picture is not uniformly bad. We know that death rates continue to fall for the youngest and the oldest, and those are the groups who are protected by high rates of public health insurance in the US. Inequality and mortality also fell in those groups. We see that death rates are much lower in France and much more equally distributed. So what this shows is that uh, the US is kind of far from the possibility frontier of what could be done in terms of saving people's lives. But it also shows that this inequality and mortality is not inevitable. It's not linked inexorably to inequality in economic outcomes. Public programs such as uh, public health insurance can have a huge impact. And fast forwarding to the epidemic, as James said, people who have um, diseases of poverty are much more likely to die from the epidemic. But again, um, you know, that isn't inevitable and public policy matters a lot as we've seen when it comes to what the impact of the epidemic is and who in the society is most affected. Thanks, Janet, that was fascinating. Um, I have to say the statistic that always gets me is that the US government spends a higher proportion or just slightly higher proportion of GDP on healthcare than the British government. Uh, for which the US gets healthcare for children, old people and veterans, uh, and of course Donald Trump, uh, and the uh, British government gets healthcare for everyone via the NHS. Um, uh, and then on top of that, of course, there's, there's health insurance costs which are very, very high. Um, I'm always amazed at how much Americans manage to spend on health. Um, David, if we uh, go over to you now, I think you're going to be focusing in even more uh, detailed looking at Switzerland. Yes, so I thought that given that we are a panel of mostly US-based experts who is speaking to a mostly Swiss-based audience in uh, today's event, uh, I wanted to uh, provide a contrast between growing income inequality in the United States and growing income inequality in Switzerland. What we see on this chart is uh, the evolution of uh, real incomes, that is um, purchasing power adjusted incomes for Switzerland in red and the United States in blue, measured at different points of the national income distribution and measured over time from 1980 to the early 2010s. If you focus first on the second panel from the left, the one that says 50th percentile, then we're looking there at the person in a given country that sits right in the middle of the income distribution with half of the population earning less and the other half more. The middle income Swiss person has always had a higher income than the middle income American person over that period, but the growth of income for these two persons has been quite comparable. That 
uh, comparability, however, gets weaker once we move further up in the income distribution. At the 90th percentile, uh, where we have a person that earns more than 90% of the people uh, in the population, there we see that starting from a relatively similar income level, uh, US incomes have grown twice as fast as those in Switzerland. And if you go even further up to the 99th percentile, to people with very, very high incomes, there we see that over this period, US incomes have more than doubled, whereas those in Switzerland have grown only by about a half. Uh, this also contrasts very, very sharply with the experience of uh, people whose incomes are low, who are at the 10th percentile of the income distribution to the very left of this chart. Here we first see that low-income Americans have a much lower level of income than low-income Swiss people. And that gap has uh, widened very, very uh, uh, considerably over time. In Switzerland, the low incomes have grown at a comparable pace than incomes in the middle of the distribution. In the United States, by contrast, the lower incomes have actually uh, declined, even as top incomes in the US have grown very, very rapidly. I presume that in this panel, we will touch on uh, some of the causes of uh, this growth in income inequality uh, within countries and between countries. But to name just a few elements that probably play a role here, uh, we first can think of uh, technological change and globalization as drivers uh, that have led to um, a reduction in the demand for uh, certain types of less qualified workers and have therefore sometimes put down their pressure on, uh, for instance, the incomes of manufacturing workers. Uh, all the while, these same developments have often benefited more highly qualified, higher income uh, workers. Moreover, while the distribution of workers' incomes has uh, become more unequal in uh, many Western countries, it is also the case in many of those countries that the fraction of the economy's aggregate income that goes to workers has been declining, while the fraction of income going to capital owners has been growing. This is in part a consequence of the enormous success of uh, very big and very profitable companies that produce a very, very large amount of profit and then pay out uh, incomes in the form of profits and dividends and interests. And since the capital ownership is very, very highly concentrated at the top of the income distribution, it will be the case that more capital income primarily drives up the incomes at the 99th percentile, where people have a very significant share of their overall income from capital, whereas everyone further down in the income distribution has mostly labor income or perhaps transfer incomes from the state, and those people will benefit much less when capital incomes are growing. The comparison between the two countries, Switzerland and the United States, of course, brings out uh, a whole range of differences that separate those countries. Uh, they have different uh, sectorial structures of their economies. They have different training systems. They have, uh, uh, in some situations, different wage setting systems, and they also have different political systems. And I think that it is a combination of these factors that has contributed to the, to the fact that Switzerland was able to maintain a relatively modest increase in income inequality over recent decades, while the United States has really seen a very, very sharp growth of inequality. Okay, thank you very much, David. Um, I thought I'd, I'd start this off by asking something that really gets to the heart of this, which, which comes to some extent from Branco's uh, sort of three ages chart, but to what extent is the rise in income inequality both within countries and between countries, something that just happens? And how much is it something that is a deliberate policy? So uh, it's notable that the three ages were interrupted, that, that Branco highlighted, were interrupted by major world wars. Um, uh, and the latest age has been all about another massive geopolitical event, China 
China joining the world economy and opening up. Um, to change, to, to get another change, do we need another giant political event? Or is this something that can be smoothly managed to try and uh, reduce the income inequalities, uh, get us back to uh, uh, the, 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 the golden age that people look back on of the, the uh, post-war years of, of uh, uh, more equal growth? Let's start, Branko. Is that, uh, t tell me how well, we okay, could Okay, I would be brief on that, you know. Uh, James, when you said the golden age, yes, it, we call it now the golden age, and I do have some doubts whether it was the golden age, but if you just look at the two indicators for the Western countries, rate of growth of the economy and the decline of inequality, in some sense, yes, it's justified to call it the golden age. But it was not the golden age for the rest of the world. Uh, and if you look at these charts uh, and the three ages, uh, I don't think that there is any doubt that from the purely cosmopolitan point of view, we are actually better off as the world now than we were then. Obviously, the incomes are much higher, and China and India have contributed significantly to that, and inequality is lower. And countries that used to be the third world have now become the first world. So, you know, there is this duality between essentially what is the decline of the West and rising inequality in Western countries, which is negative development for the West. And the globally, generally positive development, mostly because of the rise of Asia. So we know one it has really to keep in mind that these are two different points of view and um, uh, it's not uniformly good or bad. I, I certainly wouldn't, uh, wouldn't claim that uh, the golden age was a uh, was a golden age for everyone, not least even within the U.S. Of course, where there was uh, very significant segregation during Absolutely. the era. But um, but the idea of I suppose that I was trying to get at was this idea that may, it's each 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 of your ages has been split by a major geopolitical event, um, which right. probably no one wants to see, or at least I, I certainly don't want to see uh, major wars. Um, is there a way of smoothly moving to a new age where we where we in the West at least have a, a different outcome? Or is this just something that happens and it's inevitable and we have to learn to live with it and fiddle around the edges as best we can? Of course, I think that uh, Janet and David are going to speak to that. But I think that broadly speaking, people divide themselves when they discuss that, whether they believe that the main sort of culprit for the rising inequality in the US, let's say, is globalization or technological change or policy. If you believe it's policy, then obviously you can really change things tremendously. I do believe on the, on the contrary, that actually policy was really constrained by globalization and by technological change, but globalization primarily. So I'm much less, uh, how should they say, optimistic. I do believe policy matters, but I think it really takes place within the constraints that are basically imposed by globalization. Okay. Janet, I suspect you yeah. disagree on some of that at least. I, I do disagree with that. I think we have some prominent examples like the Scandinavian countries who created the, the welfare state that they have recently, right? So that was a policy choice. It reflects a lot of social consensus and there is much less inequality, even though those countries are actually a lot more open to the global economy than the US, which is a large country that has, you know, over a long period of time been fairly closed compared to other countries. So there is a policy choice. Um, also, you know, comparing the US and your, a lot of European countries, wage earners at the bottom actually earn more in the US. It's because of the tax and transfer policies in European countries that they have higher incomes, right? And so that is very directly a policy choice to protect people's incomes at the bottom of the wage distribution that we don't do in the United States. But of course, the the argument would be that there's a trade-off there, um, and the U.S. has, in general, had faster growth um, overall. Um, I mean, Switzerland is a is an obvious exception here, and you know you can always find exceptions. But compared with compared with France or the U.K., um, the argument that would be made on the right in America would be that those transfers 
reduce incentives and uh, lower innovation. And of course, America is currently having a gigantic innovation boom that European governments are worrying that they're missing out on. Right. So, um, you know, some people have argued that the real reason, though, why there's not very much redistribution in the United States really doesn't have anything to do with that. It has to do with lack of social consensus. So the fact that there are um, such different groups living in the United States who perceive that they have different interests uh, prevents there from being social consensus that would lead people to make these kinds of trade-offs, right? So if you have one group that's benefiting and the other group that's losing, it's much harder to agree that one group should give the other group something than if everybody perceives themselves as belonging to the same group. Yeah, I, I guess that's true. Um, certainly seems to be uh, seems to be an issue in some European countries as speaking as a Brit, um, uh, the famous 5248 number uh, springs to mind for Brexit. But um, David, you, you've done a lot of work focusing on on technology and uh, the rise of the superstar firms where obviously they've sort of increased inequality, but resulting from something that probably most of us would think was a good thing, which is innovation, higher productivity. Um, how does one deal with the consequences of that happening or should one? Yes, that, that really is a development that uh, combines uh, a lot of very good outcomes with, uh, with some outcomes that are uh, a lot more problematic. So uh, it, it is a pattern where just some companies that uh, apparently are innovative, are producing uh, new products that consumers uh, really like, have become so successful that uh, they uh, increasingly get the dominant positions in their respective markets. Uh, that leads these firms uh, into a position where they can uh, charge uh, uh, very, very high prices for a uh, lack of a uh, stronger competition. And that's then uh, a reason why these companies uh, become very, very profitable and generate such a high income uh, for the owners of those firms. So you have on the one side the, the positive development that these firms clearly provide innovation, provide goods and services that consumers like, and on the flip side, uh, their success uh, eventually uh, uh, reduces uh, healthy competition in the economy. Uh, we just saw um, uh, uh, a little while ago that uh, the US uh, government is now uh, investigating Google, for instance, for, uh, for uh, behaviors that perhaps uh, restrict uh, competitiveness in markets. And then, of course, we have the impact uh, on the distribution of incomes. Although I would also be more in the camp of Janet and say that to some extent, of course, uh, uh, we do have the policy options to use our tax and transfer systems to mitigate uh, uh, some of the most extreme forms of such inequalities. And how should we decide what the right level of inequality is? I mean, just you know, clearly there are very different levels of inequality historically between countries. Um, I mean, France, as the example you used, has historically had uh, far more in the way of uh, tax and government spending, uh, as well as transfers, than most even European countries, and certainly way more than the US. Um, but it's a, it, it doesn't feel as though there is a, a fixed level that anyone can say this is the right level, um, and that the rise in inequality is what people complain about mostly, rather than where they are in inequality. So even the French have been up in arms um, uh, about uh, in, in recent years with certain groups getting very cross about being hit by new taxes, protesting, smashing up Paris. Um, uh, you know, the, the rise in, they, they feel like they've missed out um, and are being punished um, in much the same way as the um, issues going on in the States, even though the rise in inequality in France has obviously been both smaller and from a, from a lower level, um, but in a sense seems to have a similar sort of political impact. Um, is it, I mean, we can't obviously say, well, the right level is just where we were five years ago or where we were in the 1950s. So how should we approach this? How should we think about this? 
Um, maybe Janet, you. Write yeah, I, I think uh, it's actually it's really hard to put a number on it, but I would say that you have too much inequality when you have some groups who can completely insulate themselves from the effect of deteriorated public services, right? So if rich people can use their own hospitals, use their own schools, live in gated communities, have their own police forces within those gated communities, that is too much inequality. When they can buy elections, you know, that is too much inequality. So you have to look at like, why do we care about inequality anyway? Do we really care about poverty or do we care about inequality per se, right? So if we only care about poverty, then we can do anti-poverty programs and reduce the effects of poverty on the lowest income people. But I would argue that one of the reasons why we care about inequality, which is like having very, very rich people, is because we think that they're going to have inordinate impact on day-to-day uh, -day life and, you know, the political process and undermine um, the quality of life for other people. And it's quite interesting that in the US, at least, the discussion on both the far left and the far right is about the, uh, the uh, corrosive effects of very rich individuals, although, of course, they, they pinpoint different very rich individuals that they complain about. But um, it's interesting that the two extremes share that same concern, maybe a, call it a concern about plutocracy, um, uh, that the, the centre doesn't seem to be nearly so worried about, um, possibly because the centre is financed by those people. <laughs> David. Sorry. Let me add, let me add uh, an additional uh, point to this consideration. You said that um, uh, people are worried about the growth of uh, income inequality, which uh, uh, I think surely is the case to, to an extent. But I think a very, very important uh, um, question is whether inequality increases in a situation where the top incomes grow while the bottom incomes are actually stagnating or declining as opposed to a situation that we've seen, for instance, in China in recent decades, where inequality has grown rapidly, but the incomes at the bottom have grown very, very rapidly, just those at the tops have even grown even faster. So in this situation, you could say, well, you know, maybe the low income earners, they, they, they still don't like the fact that there are now suddenly extremely super rich uh, people in the country. But clearly, when they look at their own uh, economic well-being, they see that they're much better off than just 10, 20, 30 years ago. But then you contrast that with an experience, uh, as I've shown in the United States, where there are actually sizable segments of the population that have seen their purchasing power stagnate or fall, and that have, like Janet has shown, even uh, perhaps have their life expectancies fall. Then, of course, you get into a situation where these people say, why should I support policies that bring overall growth uh, uh, of the economy if I'm not participating in that growth? And that, of course, uh, uh, certainly undermines uh, also in the long term uh, economic policies uh, that uh, would benefit the country overall. And of course, historically, democracy was supposed to be the solution to that, um, uh, balancing these things that if a substantial part of the population are unhappy, they should be able to kick out the kick out the leaders and get new policies. Um, is that not the answer this time? Well, I would say that this is actually uh, uh, quite clearly what still seems to be working relatively well in Switzerland. Here, of course, we, we hold uh, referendums on many important questions uh, several times a year. And so people here are voting on such issues as uh, corporate tax reform or, uh, you know, uh, uh, integration of the labor market with, uh, with uh, the rest of Europe and so forth. So many of these topics are certainly of great interest uh, to, uh, to the business community. But if they want uh, that these uh, proposals pass, if they want the votes of the of a majority of the voting population, then they also need to explain to people uh, how this serves the, the population more broadly. So you don't have a situation where just uh, uh, as in other countries, uh, 
the, the parliamentary dec uh, decisions perhaps uh, strongly overrepresent the, the interest of relatively wealthy um, and people with uh, close business ties. Hmm. Okay direct democracy as the solution, perhaps? Well, I would not perhaps go so far as to prescribe that uh, generally for, for all places, but I still think that uh, in, in Switzerland we do see exactly those debates going on where uh, if a sufficiently broad coalition should be formed in favour of some business-friendly proposal, then it's always necessary to bring on board also uh, uh, sufficiently large groups that want to know what the, the benefits of such proposals are for the broader population. It's interesting that to be interesting to contrast that with the Californian experience where the the vote typically is no we won't pay any more taxes thank you. Um, but, uh, Franco, if I can actually before that, I'll just remind everyone who's watching, um, we'll put up on the screen again the details of how to ask a question. Just uh, remember that you can do that um, at menti.com and the code should be up on the screen now. Um, Franco, can I just go over to you just to talk a bit about um, what we might call sorting um, and how much what we see in equality, particularly within Western countries, is the result of just a change in our behaviour. Um, so if you go back, go back 30, 40 years, um, there used to be quite a lot of intermarriage between classes. Um, uh, the the uh, rich people would marry far less rich people. Um, the well-educated would marry the less well-educated. Uh, nowadays, uh, university graduates marry other university graduates. Um, they focus on ensuring that their children get absolutely the best education. Um, according to some uh, US lawsuits, sometimes they bribe the universities as well. Um, how much is this just a, a self-perpetuating thing because of changed human behaviour? I mean, governments can't really legislate for who you marry. Well, let me, before I answer your question directly, let me just say that uh, when I was when I said that I was skeptical about policy, I just think that the policy first works within the framework of globalization. And secondly, I don't see uh, sufficient support for significant policy changes in the US. Now I can go through the whole list of policies that could be actually changed, but I just don't see the support for them. Uh, secondly, going back to the example of the Nordic countries, they have all had an increase in inequality. Actually, uh, Sweden had more significant increase in inequality than even the US. And all of these countries, including US and Nordic countries, are countries with extremely heavy concentration of capital incomes. So going back to you know, David's point with the rising capital share, we basically have a quasi-automatic transmission in interpersonal inequality because of heavy concentration of financial capital in the hands of essentially 10% of people. So that case, this is the case for all the Western countries. I mean, you take whatever you want, the differences are fairly small in concentration of financial capital. So, so long as the capital share goes up, you really have an inbuilt force towards increasing inequality. Now, going directly to your question, I actually argue there are you know, two additional systemic forces uh, in, that's what I argue in capitalism alone. One of them is that you will refer to, and many other people have written about that, it is this assortative mating or homogamy where actually people of similar education levels and income levels marry each other. That has a very important effect, not only statically, that you increase inequality, but through investment in education of children, they basically are in the process of forming something which looks like an arist aristocracy. And I think that has a really very strong impact on social mobility. The second thing is what I call homoplutia, which is something new, which has not been noticed before. And this is that the same people are rich, both in terms of labor income and capital income. This is something totally different from classical capitalism. In classical capitalism, obviously you had rich factory owners, but they were not working for wages. And here you really have people who are really at the top 10% by wage earnings and top 10% by capital earnings. And I think that also raises an issue. Just imagine that you have, and very often you do, a couple of highly educated, both of them with high incomes. And on top of that, they are both having high capital income and labor income. And this is actually the reality with which we have to deal 
in the US, but I think in many other Western countries as well. I actually, I would like to make a couple of points. Just going back to what you said about a golden age, uh, uh, you know, in the 50s and 60s, it certainly wasn't for women. And I'll just say that. And then also this business about assortative matching. One reason why college educated men are more likely to marry college educated women is because there are a whole lot more college educated women now, right? So just mechanically, there are, you know, before college educated men had to marry high school educated women because there weren't any college educated women for them to marry. So a lot of it actually is, is a fairly mechanical result of changes that have improved the lot of women a lot. But I, I think it's I think it's also true of incomes. So the the richest men tend to marry the richest women. Um, or the highest income men marry the highest income women, which didn't used to be the case. So that does seem to be a change there. Um, and and I guess that you know is is different to the the pure university um, uh, graduate question. Um, but. Yeah, it certainly it certainly does seem um, does seem a, a difficult a difficult question to address um, for any government. Um, if you know if if you say a lot of the inequality just comes about, uh, I almost want to say it organically, um, but without any um, uh, without anything other than the choices of the individuals of who to get together with. One should not overemphasize that, but it does actually represent an additional element. And what is uh, difficult with things like homoplutia and homogamy is that both of them are fundamentally good developments. I mean, obviously, assortative mating is a good development in the sense that people have much more choice whom to marry. And as Janet said, there were no women or there were not sufficient number of women in the past who were actually in the same position. So it's a very favorable development, but it does have an impact on inequality. Likewise, the fact that actually you have people who are now rich both in terms of capital and labor is also a favorable development compared to just having people who are rich in terms of capital. But it does make policy decisions, including taxation, much more difficult. And can I just change the topic slightly? We've talked quite a bit about what has happened and a fair bit about what should happen. Can we talk a bit about what you think is actually likely to happen? Um, there's a lot of talk about a K-shaped recovery um, that coming out of coming out of the pandemic, the better off will get even better off and the worse off will get even worse off. Um, David, is this something you see happening and just the, the likelihood that it happens or is this something that will be different depending on the country policy responses and so on? Well, I do think that uh, a big difference in the first place, as you had already mentioned in your introduction, is that, of course, for many higher income people, like uh, for um, us university professors on this panel, the crisis uh, is not a, a big uh, economic shock, right? Uh, we, we are uh, the, the lucky knowledge workers who can do home office relatively well, who have jobs that are not that exposed uh, to those shocks. And so in that sense, uh, we, we don't really need much of a recovery uh, in the first place because we don't have had much of a negative uh, shock in the crisis. So the question, of course, much more is uh, what to do with, uh, you know, these people uh, who are doing jobs in restaurants, uh, uh, which are uh, is a very large segment of jobs that is both uh, very low paid and is uh, very heavily hit uh, by this crisis. And of course, there uh, it's certainly a concern that we will see uh, uh, such jobs, you know, only coming back slowly. Perhaps uh, there is a longer term impact on, uh, you know, people traveling less also under uh, the, the influence of uh, concerns about the environment. Um, that there is a possibility that in other areas like in manufacturing, some of the jobs will instead be uh, replaced by machines when uh, uh, demand for products increases again. So I do think that there uh, uh, the challenges are much bigger. And then we should also not forget, of course, of, of young people who uh, had now the time when normally they would enter the labor market and that uh, labor market entry has been uh, 
uh, delayed or made more difficult. And I think a very, very big challenge for, for many uh, um, uh, Western societies is uh, what to do with people who sort of never gain much of a foothold in the labor market uh, and who then very often also uh, uh, are showing up in the statistics, you know, of uh, uh, all kinds of other uh, problematic uh, behaviors. Yeah, this is the lost generation danger, right? Um, and Janet, is it, what's, what's your expectation? Do you think things are going to get better because people have been shocked by the pandemic or worse, as David is, uh, is suggesting maybe possible? Yeah, so I guess this is one of those cases where you hope for the best and prepare for the worst in the sense. Uh, so the latest numbers I've seen, for example, with unemployment suggest that after a very deep V, um, you know, up to 16% unemployment, now it's back to around 8 or 9% unemployment. So it's looking more like unemployment levels in the Great Recession. We know how long it took to recover from that. So, you know, if nothing else terrible happens, perhaps we would be on that kind of uh, trajectory. What I think is interesting is thinking about some of the things that happened during the pandemic. For example, realizing that a lot of the lowest paid workers are actually essential, you know, that things can't function without them. The fact that they gave this $600 bonus to people on unemployment insurance and then like policymakers obviously made a mistake. I don't think they were intending to give people more money than their usual salary in unemployment insurance benefits. I think it shows that most members of Congress had no idea how little most people were earning because they're all millionaires. Uh, and so, you know, what is the effect on the, of the people themselves realizing that I can get this, when I got this subsidy, it was worth more than my wage income, you know, and, and they see that like there could be a wage floor. It could make people a lot better off. Um, it's expensive, but maybe not completely unsustainable to think of something like that. So I'm just wondering if there might be some effects just by demonstrating these kinds of things to, to many people on politics in the future. Hi, hello, and welcome back. Um, as you can see, we've changed uh, this. We're now on the live part of the session. We're going to have some uh, Q&A um, that you've submitted. Um, I want to start here with a, a question that's highly relevant to everything we've been discussing and perhaps in the minds of many of those uh, amongst the wealthier today, the stock market down 3% already. Um, uh, so I think if maybe if I come to come to you with this one, David, but capital incomes becoming increasingly important um, as uh, one of the things we've been discussing. But of course, only those who are already rich are benefiting. So how do we restore a balance to it? And I suppose I would add in, of course, those people are are making more precisely because they are taking some risk. And in the past, every now and again, there is a disastrous financial crash which wipes out a lot of their wealth. Uh, I don't think many of us would want to see another disastrous financial crash, but maybe that's the answer to fix uh, fix high levels of inequality if the problem is is too much concentration of wealth. Do you have a different solution, even more pleasant? Well, one uh, of the reasons, of course, why uh, uh, on the individual level some very high uh, amounts of wealth have been uh, allowed to accumulate is because in many countries capital is taxed in a very favorable way relative to labor income. And uh, a big uh, impact of course also comes from uh, from estate taxation, that is what happens to, to wealth when it uh, transitions from one generation to the next and again there uh, many countries, including Switzerland, have moved to a taxation scheme that uh, has uh, made it easier to um, uh, bring money from one generation to the next. So it's certainly the case that uh, in, in that domain, uh, the tax and transfer system also has historically had a very important uh, role in, uh, in you know, determining to what extent these inequalities are able to increase or not. 
Okay. And uh, Janet, do you have a different view on on that? No, I agree with that. I think what David said was essentially that higher taxes on capital income would go a long way to fix that problem. Okay, so this is essentially thinking back to 1960s, 70s uh, sort of um, period when uh, the markets obviously in that period, in the 1960s at least, the stock markets did fabulously well, uh, but we didn't see this sharp rise in inequality in the same way because there were very high levels of capital gains tax, very high levels of income tax. Uh, you've got the Beatles singing Taxman, of course, a classic complaint by the very rich uh, about the levels of taxation. Um, let me um, let me come in then with uh, maybe one for uh, one for Branco here, um, which is to ask about South Africa, Brazil, and India. Um, it is is a wealth tax a solution to the high levels of inequality in those countries? And uh, is the uh, if not, is it because it might result in massive capital flight? It's a difficult question. I could more easily say that actually I agree both with, with Janet and David that in the case of the U.S. Uh, equalization of um, uh, tax on capital and labor plus uh, much stronger inheritance tax, which has been also reduced in the U.S. And of course, countries like Sweden and Norway don't have it anymore. So these are the ways to go. Now, when it comes to countries that are not as rich, the situation is more difficult. Obviously, South Africa is a really prime example of an extremely unequal country and not maybe many people know that actually inequality in South Africa is currently higher than it was under apartheid. Uh, so possibly, you know, I don't know the South African system, taxation system, but possibly taxation of wealth would be one way to do that. But I think the problems in those countries are in some sense deeper uh, uh, than they are in uh, richer countries that because of higher wealth you actually have higher opportunities to make olives. Uh, likewise for India, you know, India has had of course a very good period in terms of growth, has had the period with like lots of people who have become uh, uh, billionaires. Now the question is whether you really would like them to contribute more towards uh, you know public goods and to tax them more. And finally, Brazil has had a period of the declining inequality under three governments, you know, not only under Lula and Dilma, but the previous government, Cardoso, as well. Uh, that has been reversed, but, you know, it is also very difficult now to tell what is happening with Bolsonaro because of the corona crisis. Um, so the bottom line is, I think, actually, for each individual country, you would need to know much more about the taxation. Okay, so, so specific taxes are a pragmatic question of how do you extract the money whilst avoiding the tax avoidance by whatever that is, and that just depends on the country. Okay, that makes sense. James, if I may, if yeah. I may uh, let me point out that the next event of the UBS uh, Centre Forum this year, uh, which takes place next Tuesday, is my colleague uh, Florian Scheuer from the University of Zurich talking about taxing the super rich. So yeah, we have a promotion. Uh, uh, certainly provide uh, a lot of insight on this topic to all of our viewers who are interested. Yeah, we'll have a we'll have a, all the details of that coming up at the end. So um, uh, if you if you have your diaries handy, viewers, um, you might want to uh, be ready to write that down. Um, Janet, can I ask what would nice question here from a reader? But what would be the two most effective policies that would uh, reduce the inequality and mortality in the U.S.? Uh, so there's two things. So one of them has to do with the opioid epidemic, um, which is really important in driving some of the mortality patterns that we see. And I think there's a number of very concrete things that could be done in terms of reducing prescriptions of opioids, which is a lot, which is how a lot of people became addicted to begin with and also uh, promoting effective treatment. So there is medication assisted treatment, it's been shown to save lives, but it's very hard often for people to access that and that's partly a matter of policy in, in the US. I, I also think um, Europeans should be on their guard. Is the same companies that promoted prescription opioids in the US 
have actually been working in Europe to undermine some of the laws in in European countries that control prescription of opioids and also to promote the same sort of story about how doctors have a duty to treat pain and there's so much pain that's not treated and so on and so forth. In some cases, you have health ministers of European countries saying this and it's directly the line that was pushed by the, the pharma companies through their uh, surrogates in, in the US. So it could happen in, in Europe too, if people are not careful. So that's number one. Number two it has to do with, um, you know, universal health insurance, which we're still struggling with in, in the US. But even if you have universal health insurance, there's a lot of evidence that the way that it's organized can be very important. Um, small barriers like small copays, um, difficulty accessing treatment can make a big difference in whether people get things like preventive care that they need. Uh, so those are the two things that I would point to. It's like, just don't rest on your morals. If you have universal health care, you have to keep working to make sure people can use it and, and use it effectively. Okay. And, and is there a danger there that uh, I mean, I, I sort of uh, laughed at the statistic earlier about just how much the US spends on healthcare and how relatively inefficient its outcomes are. But it, is there an element here of redirecting spending that some people will have to accept less good outcomes than they would normally get? You know, the tricky thing about healthcare is that there actually is a consumption element of it. So sometimes I ask, uh, you know, my students, well, think about food, right? Food is a necessity. We think everybody should have access to the food that they need to live. But we also have five star restaurants, right? And people like to go and eat in five star restaurants. And why shouldn't they, you know, if they want to spend their money that way? We don't say like no one should have access to fancy restaurants. So with healthcare, there is actually a, a similar element in that what we want is not that everybody has access to the equivalent of five star restaurants, but that everybody has access to the care that they need. And then if other people want to buy other types of health care, you know, maybe, maybe they should be allowed to do that. But then isn't that again just the question of where should we draw the line at inequality? And mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things uh, one might say, if you liked the current US system, would be that it already does that. It draws the line and says, well, the basic thing you should get is if you're a child, you should get good free health care. And if you're an old person, you should get good free health care. And the rest of the time, you should work to buy your own five star restaurant health care, um, if that's what you wish. That would, would that not be precisely that sort of argument? Again, it's the question of where do we put the bar? and here in Europe, we put it much higher and say everyone should get a basic level. And in the US, you've historically put a, a much lower bar and said only certain people get it, but they get then very, very good. Yeah, I think, I mean, that that is true. I, I think most people in the US think that the bar should be higher, that, that more people should have access to basic care. And then, you know, there's a variety of reasons why that doesn't happen. In terms of the quality of care at the, the high end, you know, it's people come from all over the world to access medical services in, in the US and there are hospitals that are among the best in the world. So that's kind of the reality of how, how it is. Some people can't get anything at all and then some people can get what's the best in the world. Okay. So we've been talking a lot about inequalities between countries and between groups. We haven't really talked about inequalities between the generations at all. Um, I mentioned right at the start that uh, COVID-19 has, has obviously been very unequal. Um, uh, it has, it's tended to hit old people much harder, but at the same time, the lockdowns have tended financially to hit young people much harder. So far more young people have been losing their jobs uh, than older people and far more young people do jobs that can't be done from home. Um, can you talk a bit about the 
the problems of this. It, it feels like this goes to the core of inequality of outcome versus inequality of opportunity, that the young people are the people who should have opportunity in front of them that maybe they're seeing taken away. Um, Branko, is this something you, um, you sort of see out there? Well, I would say a very few things about that. I recently there was a study using Luxembourg income survey data, and I work with these are micro data from household surveys, and that looked at the cohorts of uh, uh, young people now versus uh, cohorts of people of the same age 30 years ago. And uh, of course, the surprising thing to some extent is that uh, uh, incomes, real incomes of people today, of the young cohort now is lower than it was uh, uh, before. And there are a number of other parameters which are actually worse today, like uh, uh, the number of uh, uh, young people who live with the parents, in, I mean, assuming that of course you would prefer to live by yourself and you don't have enough <laughs> income to live by yourself and similar things. So there is a, some of that, I think particularly also in the United States of that, um, uh, how should I say, disappointment in expectations, which is quite present among millennials. And uh, there is, uh, of course, the, the fact that uh, the baby boomers were a very large generation by numbers, and they have been able through their uh, size and then providing also large consumption, uh, consuming power, they have, and of course, voting power, they have been able to actually go through their lives during the first part of the so-called golden age, it's called Glorieuse in French, and they actually had fairly good um, working life and then were able also through um, uh, ability to get the pension systems and maybe medical systems as well, uh, very convenient and comfortable for them to create this gap in between generations. And of course we have seen in the US work by Chetty and numerous authors, authors who work with Chetty, you cannot really count them anymore. Uh, they have, of course, found uh, practically the same results about uh, up, absence of a much, or at least much lower absolute and certainly relative um, mobility of the current generations of the young people compared to their parents. And there's more to that than just that they've lived longer. Um, obviously, if you live longer, you have higher savings, you have more capital. Um, one of the things that comes out of the uh, ex you know, lower mortality, but also longer life expectancy, is perhaps we should expect more inequality as a result of that. Is that, a, is that an underlying cause or is this really just a, a political capture because um, no, one in, no one in America can afford to uh, annoy the AARP um, and retired people just to have the power, the voting power to control the system? Yeah, I, I don't know, actually, it's a good question. I, I don't know if the fact that actually life expectancy has become, of course, longer, uh, you know, I mean, logically, yes, let's suppose that people live 150 years, you know, let's suppose the baby boomers live 150 years, obviously, they would control the political process even more. Uh, so yes, I think in principle that that's the case, but I really uh, I'm I'm not sure if that uh, that has been studied and the difference in life expectancy is uh, so high. Um, you know, it's a little bit like Prince Charles and his uh, mother. You know, so basically he would apparently never become a king, or if he becomes, it would be for five minutes. So you know, it's a little bit like that. Um, okay. Actually, my, my colleague Ileana Kuziemko has done some interesting work linking um, how the elderly vote on things like expansions of health care to other groups to kind of their own privileged position. So if you look at opinion polls, a lot of elderly people in the U.S. are against expanding Medicaid because they're afraid that it would be at their expense, that some money would be taken from Medicare to pay for health insurance for you know, other groups in the population. And in fact, the Affordable Care Act did have an element of that. There, there was an additional tax on Medicare that was supposed to pay for some of this expansion. And that was one reason why it was opposed by groups like uh, AARP. Okay, so this come this does come back to the point of improving equality 
for obviously the people who are beneficiaries will vote for it and the but the people who are current benefits of the current system are not going to be so happy um david there's a very specific question here for you which is about the swiss dual education system and the focus on vocational training um is that part of the reason that the um uh, Swiss income inequality has not risen by more? Um, I think this could be one of the elements that, you know, is a, is a candidate explanation. Um, one thing that we see in Switzerland is that uh, this country not only has um, very high salary levels in international comparisons, but the, the salary gaps are uh, actually very, very large also for um, jobs at the lower end of the of the income distribution, and I think one way by which Switzerland is able to uh, uphold these uh, fairly high salaries uh, for workers, uh, you know, without college education, is by having fairly highly trained people, uh, highly trained in a specific vocational field. Uh, doing uh, such jobs at the, at the fairly fairly high quality, so um, I think for all the, the people who you know had to do, for instance, with a craftsman who do repair, repairs, home repairs, and so on, uh, there is uh, a lot of anecdotal evidence that there is an important quality difference between such workers in Switzerland and, for instance, in the United States. And that quality difference, I think, has to do a lot with training, and then also. Uh, of course, leads to very, very different uh, salary levels. So you can have basically an equilibrium where you have uh, workers who, you know, are relatively unqualified to uh, low quality jobs and are paid poorly, or you can have uh, more trained people doing a good job and being uh, paid a very high salary. Okay, so this is again a policy question that the government chooses to spend more on education, or is it actually of different way of spending on education. So well, it is at the expense of something else, I suppose. It's, it's a very sophisticated off. sort of, you know, public private partnership. So where, where, the, where the government sort of funds uh, vocational uh, uh, training uh, or if for, for sort of like specialized schools, but then also businesses uh, provide the actual uh, training jobs and hire uh, these young people and train them. And um, uh, this, uh, you know, this this is a setting which I do think has uh, has certainly the advantage that uh, you get um, um, a training that is more directly targeted towards the skills that are currently needed in the marketplace. Um, on the flip side, uh, I think if uh, if a very very large fraction of uh, of a young cohort goes to university then there is a certain risk that there are in the end too many people who are, you know, trained with uh, general knowledge um, that that in the end uh, might might not find a sufficient demand in the marketplace. Too many people doing liberal studies courses, perhaps. Is that the, the problem you speak? Well, it's certainly the case that, you know, some uh, research from the United States even shows that there seem to be universities that create negative value added to, to students, right? That, that there are sometimes uh, universities, uh, uh, some of them uh, operating on a for-profit basis that spend most of their resources into doing advertisement and convincing students who come out of poor families where no one went to college that really getting a degree is a fantastic thing and is worthwhile taking out a big student loan and then they provide uh, very poor instruction uh, by unqualified uh, uh, personnel and, uh, and the students end up with debt and have not learned much. So that, that can be actually a, a real problem, right? And so in that sense, we certainly need to be a little bit careful to just, you know, uh, uniformly promote people getting more education because always we need to ask also what's the quality yes. of the education and is that actually something that is needed in the workplace. Yeah. So this is a this is a failure of the free market that people are people are choosing badly. Um, it, it's a it's a place where the free market doesn't benefit either the customer or the wider society in that sense. 
well, it comes out of, uh, of an information uh, asymmetry, right? It's sort of like people who wrongly assume that uh, that such a degree uh, would be very helpful. And uh, uh, perhaps in, in some situations, uh, you know, it's not it's not that trivial for everyone to uh, uh, perfectly judge uh, what uh, the quality of a given education will be. OK, so we're, we're coming up to the end now. Um, I think we've got one time for one last question, which is I wanted to just ask about the second wave um, in Europe, or I, I should say the third wave in the US of coronavirus, um, which is now getting very serious. It's the reason, of course, the market's down so much today. Um, is there, uh, should governments be stepping in again with what were compared with normal recessions, very generous support packages um, or, or does there come and I mean even if the answer to that is yes at what point should they say well we can't do this anymore we have to let the let things adjust and that's going to mean letting a whole lot of people lose jobs does that ever does that point ever come Janet I know you have to run off so let's start with you on this um, yeah I, I mean we're stuck in the United States in this horrible political situation where they can't agree on anything. But I, I, I think, well, or to be more precise, everyone agrees that there has to be another stimulus, but no one can agree on exactly what it is. So I'm hoping we'll get over the hump and uh, get on with it uh, after the election. OK. And David, is, this, is, it a, is it sustainable? I mean, where do, what point do we get zombie... Uh, zombie firms appearing. This is a, 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 a you know, new new part of the economics literature since uh, since the last recession. But is uh, is there a worry here that the government's supporting bits of the economy that just don't make sense anymore? Well, you you always have um, uh, some firms that you know under normal conditions, absent uh, a crisis, would have gone out of business. Um, uh, by stabilizing the economy, of course, one will uh, carry through potentially some of those firms. But really, in the end, uh, the, the, the question is less uh, whether such firms exist. It's more whether uh, uh, it's still a viable policy uh, to provide support to the economy because one thinks that the, the structures that are being preserved are uh, uh, to their majority actually uh, structures that deserve to be uh, preserved. And uh, it's certainly the case in, in with, with lockdown measures in particular, right, that uh, uh, without uh, some form of government support, there might just be a, a massive wave of bankruptcy of uh, firms and organizations that would be perfectly viable uh, if hopefully in a few months we will uh, get a normalization of the situation where we can uh, more and more return to uh, life as it used to be. Let's hope so. Um, uh, Branko, do you have do you have something to add on this point? I just think that these two things are related. I mean, if you go for a lockdown or quasi lockdown, then it doesn't seem to me possible to avoid actually having the same stimulus package or similar package that were existed before, that was done before. The question is actually for how long can it go? I mean, can we have another maybe lockdown in the next spring? So can you have, go with the third package and the fourth package? So obviously there is a certain limit at which time you would not be able to run it. But I believe currently, if you look at the situation in Europe and some countries seem to be moving like France towards that, um, towards some kind of a lockdown, then it seems to me the lockdown will have to go together with the, with the package simply because people would have, as they did not, would not have had in the past, they just would not have income. Yeah, this is the problem that if the government shuts down the economy, they can't really expect people people to put up with the government telling them they can't have a job without some form of compensation. Yeah, um, exactly. But it's, yeah, as you say, it's it, there must come some point where the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth wave, at some point you just have to say, well, that's life. Let's hope that this is the final wave and we can deal with it next Let's year. Let's hope, yeah. Yeah. OK, well, um, we, I'm going to say thank you. I think we've now hit our time limit. Thank you to all three of you. That was an excellent panel. Um, Florian earlier mentioned, sorry, Florian, David earlier mentioned that his colleague Florian um, has a session coming up 
um, to discuss some of these uh, issues around taxation. Um, we have a have a little promotion here with the details. Um, so you can see on the screen there, Florian Scheuer, um, the session on taxing the super rich. And we also after that have the inequality and the future of capitalism discussion um, with very well known uh, Nobel uh, winner uh, Angus Dayton, um, uh, which I, I strongly suggest you tune into. Um, and uh, other than that, I just want to say thank you very much. Um, uh, the UBS Centre says they're very keen to welcome you back. Um, and you can, of course, follow the discussion about all this session and all the others uh, on social media with the hashtag UBS Centre Forum or Economics for Society. Um, and the uh, details, if you miss them on the screen, will all be on the web page at ubscentre.uzh.ch. So thank you very much. I'm James McIntosh. Goodbye.